Okay, we're live again. Let me pull up the old YouTube. Uh, boom. Okay, we'll just create. God damn it. Try to be a workhorse on this site, and they just keep fucking with you. I don't know. Maybe I need to start doing more videos or something instead of these. I like the live streams, though. Anyway, welcome to the second live stream of the day. Food. Fish hits the fire. Steve like Reichland's Project Fire. Oh, God. This is going to suck. It's a whole fucking episode. Anyway, let's get into it. This show, Fish Hits the Fire, what's up first? Halibut Hits the Fire, grilled in banana leaves. And we have Raphael coming. Chef Raphael Lunetta shows us... Oh, great, so Steven's just given up. ...his Indonesian-inspired wood-grilled branzino. This is insanely delicious. I grill fresh oysters with Asian aromatics. And I travel back to my cooking school days in Paris with a Project Fire twist on classic salmon coulis. Didn't you want to be a novelist? Yeah. Woo! Looks amazing, right? From the Alisal Guest Ranch and Resort in Solvang, California, I'm Stephen Reichlin. And this is... Okay, you're not really riding horses. You're riding stable horses that are, tra that are trail trained. They know where they're going. Project Fire. Stephen Reichland's Project Fire is made possible by. You go in with a bunch of gr you you go in with a bunch of other yuppie fucking faggots, and then you think, oh, I'm a real cowboy. I Barbecue, makers of the Angara Social Grilling Table, with a contemporary interactive. That is an insult to grilling. Design that allows everyone to barbecue. That is an insult to grilling. Get your fucking wine off my barbecue. More information at ibbq.com. Hold on. Let's just stop here for a second. And let us check out ibbq.com. Fine. Show me. Oh my god. All right, do they have Okay. Oh, and it only costs $10,000. <laughs> it's only 10 grand. <laughs> oh my god. This is Oh, by the way, that is the propane Heidi box. This is grilling. A bunch of people drinking beer. One guy behind a fucking grill hotter than the halls of hell. And he's cooking. Then we sit down and eat. You don't have a bunch of yuppie fucking faggots on some little piss ass grill. So basically, you paid 10 grand for an extremely small grill and a shitty table. And they're drinking wine. All they're doing, oh God. The Bradley Smart Smoker with app enabled time and temperature controls. I hate those things. If you want to smoke, get a stick burner. I'm sorry. Yes, it's a lot. Okay, okay. To be fair to these things, they are convenient. I will say that they are convenient. But. If you want to, if you put the time in, these things will not beat a stick burner. More at BradleySmoker.com. Yeti, built for the wild. Yeti is what yuppies think is built for the wild. I have a Yeti coffee mug. It's delicious. It's great. It keeps my coffee delicious. It's also extremely expensive. Also, the cups ain't cheap. But then again, this is on PBS. A, uh, and PBS, uh, star stands for Prissy Billionaire Sycophants. Memphis Woodfire Grills. 
I already talked about them. Komodo, Komodo. Yeah. That one right there, I believe, is $9,000. Remote grilling starts with Maverick. Kalamazoo Outdoor Gourmet. Owner of the $72,000 grill. Fogo Premium Lump Charcoal. All right, hold on. I got to see this. What makes this so special? Oh, let's see. Come on, hurry up before I get old. Let's see. Fogo Premium Lump Charcoal. Twenty five bucks a bag. Now, why should I pay for this? Okay, thirty bucks a bag. Super premium hardwood lump charcoal. I can pick this up in any hardware store. Oh, it's specifically designed for my tomato big green egg or what the fuck ever. Lights quickly, burns hotter and longer. I don't want my I don't want my fucking lump charcoal to burn longer. Jesus Christ. Once again, just overpriced garbage for a bunch of idiots that watch PBS that don't actually know how to grill. Hey, idiots, I can teach you how to do all this with a $100 Weber, uh, probably a $12 bag of lump charcoal from Walmart, and we'll be good. Adrenaline Barbecue Company. And by the following... Oh, God. Fish on the grill. Four simple words that strike fear into the hearts of novice grillers. What if it sticks to the grill grate? Or it dries out, or overcooks, or breaks apart when you go to turn it? Well, fear no more because Project Fire will walk... What did you do to that catfish? Walk you through every step of the grilling process, from grilling whole fish and fillets to fire roasting shellfish. Fresh fish, hot fire. There's no better way to cook seafood. Long before there were barbecue grills, people wrapped food in leaves and roasted it in the fire. They still do in Singapore, birthplace of this halibut grilled in banana leaves. Think fiery spice paste, smoky leaves, and supernaturally moist fish. So make sure we taste none of the halibut. You'll need to know about a few special ingredients. The first are these fiery Thai chilies. The second is lemongrass, an aromatic Southeast Asian herb. And the third is turmeric, a root with a bright orange color and pungent flavor. All three are available at most natural food stores and of course at Asian markets. Start by placing in a food processor, coarsely chopped shallots, fresh garlic, and fresh turmeric. Not to be not to be a dick, but that's like thirty dollars worth of shallots. You can get the same effect, by the way, Steve, with spending a dollar on a garlic clove and about a, and another dollar on a red onion. Because you do know that shallots are just a garlic-onion hybrid. You, you're aware of that, right? Right? Next add rough chopped lemongrass, fresh ginger, fiery Thai chilies, and mac... Do you really need to with all the fresh ginger in there? Damien nuts. In Singapore, they'd use a nut called a candle nut, but the macadamia gives you the same effect. Finally, chop these ingredients in a food processor. 
Then add plenty of freshly ground black pepper and Asian fish sauce. This is a pickled anchovy sauce. If unavailable, you could use soy sauce. Uh, fish sauce is available in most decently sized supermarkets. And enough vegetable oil to obtain a thick paste. If I was trying to go authentic, I'd use peanut oil, but that's just me. And there's your spice paste. Now the next step is a very typical Southeast Asian technique, frying the spice paste to intensify its flavor. Heat a wok, add some vegetable oil, take your spice paste and add it to the oil. There you go. Oh. Right and fry it until it's golden brown. I've only been in a couple of Asian markets. Maybe I'll have to actually, and I didn't know what the hell I was doing, so maybe I'll have to go back to one. To make the banana leaves pliable, grill them for a few seconds on each side. Then we'll come back, turn it over. It's a quick grill, really, just until the banana leaf wilts. Now take a look. The spice paste has cooked down. I'll just turn the heat off. Let this cool to room temperature. Meanwhile, for your fish, I have a beautiful halibut filet here, and I'll cut it into slices about a half an inch thick. Forgive my ignorance, but is halibut native to that area? Halibut is a firm, delicate white fish. Other good options. Then why the fuck are you gonna slather it with a spicy paste? Can you give the halibut a chance to fucking sing? Options might be skate, might be mahi mahi. You could even use cod. The spice paste is cool. Let me taste it. <sighs> delicate white fish, but hold on. Let me slather it with this shit. Oh my god! This is the type of thing I would use on catfish! Mm. Intensely aromatic with a nice chili afterburn. To assemble the fish bundles, place a little spice paste on the bottom, a piece of halibut in the center, a little more spice paste on top, then roll over one side, fold over the other side, fold over one end, okay, the maybe. other end, and secure the ends with a toothpick. The banana leaves serve several purposes. They help seal in the spice paste flavor. They also keep the fish nice and moist. When you grill these packets, the banana leaves are gonna burn. They're gonna create their own leafy smoke flavor, and that will flavor the fish as well. Now the fun part. I'll cook the halibut bundles on a grill table. This long, slender grill reminds me of the satay grills you find in Singapore. So arrange. Why do I think if any, if any Singaporeans heard this, they'd want to shove those tongs up his ass? The bundles, toothpick side down on the fire. The cooking time is quick. Three to five minutes per side will do it. Don't be afraid to just rotate these around. Keep the food moving. That's the best way to keep it from burning. And once the bottoms of the packets are nicely... Or you could do this crazy grilling technique. Hold on. This crazy technique. It's brand new, guys. It's going to burn your minds. Like you're going to think you looked at Cthulhu when I tell you what this crazy technique is. It'll drive you mad. You can always use indirect grilling. You know where the heat is on one side and the food is on the other? 
You know that method? It does. It's not just for smoking, Steve. You can make... This would be a time to use indirect grilling. Fuck me. How does this guy know not... Does not know the this basic, basic grilling technique. Where you have the coals on one side and you got the food on the other. F fuck me. Charred, turn them over and continue grilling the halibut on the other side. The halibut bundles look cooked, but to check... Yeah, exactly. I would, if this was me... I would simply just put the halibut in an indirect... Hell, I'd probably put it on my smoker. Maybe light a fire and, yeah, a little water pan in there to create some steam. Just insert an instant read meat thermometer. 145 degrees. Except I wouldn't have done it like this because I'm not going to slather hal halibut with a super spicy paste mix. Again, sign of a weak chef. Let's just make sure they can't fucking taste anything. Bingo. Pull out the toothpicks and just unwrap the bundle. You can see the fish is really moist. So take a taste. Mmm. Well, this is intensely flavorful. Nice chili kick and really moist. Yeah, because basically you have a glass of chili water. The only thing missing is the party. Come on in, folks. Good, right? Oh, unbelievably pretentious beer. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Here's to barbecue. He is a and by the way, I am not an expert on fish. That's something I'm going to start doing. I'm going to start cooking a little more fish. Um, but Jesus, I the little I know, the only one you treat like a steak, there's only two that I know you treat like a steak. And that's tuna and salmon. Former professional surfer turned very professional chef. For 19 years, he ran the celebrated giraffe restaurant in oh, okay. Santa Monica. His newest venture, Lunetta, is a 4,000 square foot restaurant with a 72 inch. Yeah, if I'm cooking some delicate piece of white fish, I'm gonna, f like catfish I can do anything with because they're bottom feeders. Halibut, I'd be, I'd. <laughs> No, I, I do some, uh, a few things different. It's wood burning grill. Rafael Lunetta, welcome to Project Fire. Thank you very much. Like, catfish is a perfect frying fish. Or, 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 or If he did it with catfish, I wouldn't be bitching right now. That type of thing that he did, wrapping it up with a spice mix and a banana leaf, that's, that's for catfish. But keep in mind, catfish are bottom feeders. Stephen, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. I see all sorts of incredible things on the table. What are we going to make today? So this is an inspiration from a dish that I had in Bali many years okay. ago. And I stumbled upon this restaurant with the palapa roof. And basically, you could be barefooted. Feet in the sand. Feet, feet in the eyes sand. Eyes on the water. Eyes on yeah, plate. a good oh, cold man. beer. And they were cooking uh, this wood-grilled fish over local wood. Mm. And they had this very interesting spice that they used. And I uh, called a friend, and I tried to explain the uh, complexity and the understanding of what I remembered. Yeah. And she was able to put this together for okay. us. So let's see. Very aromatic. And I'm getting curry and toasted coconut. Okay, that's the first thing on the smell. Little turmeric, definitely coconut. Little citrus. What, what would the citrus be? So I think that's kefir lime leaf. Man, this is beautiful it's stuff. What we're going to do is I'm going to take uh, the fish, and I'm just going to take a little bit of spice. I want to go easy with it because it is a strong spice, and I don't want it to overpower it too much. But I'll do a little bit of olive oil on the inside with the spice. Okay. Gee, what a shock. If Reichlin was cooking it, 
He'd have fucking dumped that whole bowl on the bastard. And the fish you're using, you call it lou de mer. I guess we would know it as a Mediterranean sea bass. Mediterranean sea bass. The Italians know it as a... Oh, Benzino, really? Okay. Um, also known as a sea bream. Yeah, apparently uh, this dish is... Yeah, not for the average folk. Okay. We're going to cook it skin side down. Okay. I'm going to finish it in the sizzle pan. Okay. With By the way, that is another, I think, eight... God, I... Another several thousand dollar grill. With a little bit of wine. By the way, if you get a Weber and you know what you're doing, you can do this exact same thing. It's an Argentinian style grill. I would actually uh, maybe add it one day to my collection. The grill feels pretty good right now. Okay. How so do you think? It. How's well, it feel I, for yeah, you? I go sort of one Mississippi, two Mississippi, ouch, and I say that's a pretty hot fire. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, ouch, it's okay. good. All good. right, I All like right. it. Hit it with a grill brush, Thank you. and then you've got a grill. Never, ever, ever. If I see you using these grill brushes, I will kick your ass. You know why? Those fucking little metal wires come off and get in your fucking food. You eat it, and then you're in the goddamn hospital. Never use those brushes. Grill oiler over there. I'm going to take this. Use a guy either A, heat clean the motherfucker. Or B, uh, get a wood, like a, like a wood scraper. Do not use those wire brushes. Again, unless you want to go in for stomach surgery. It's up to you. Mm -hmm. And I'll use the tongs just in case. Okay. Now the idea for me is to try to just get it a little bit. Because I used to use wire brushes. I stopped. You know why? I made a batch of hamburgers and then I noticed on every damn one of them, there were metal filings. After that, I threw every metal brush I had away. Do not use those. Horrible. Golden brown. I obviously don't want to burn it. Sure. And what I like to do is I like to press the fish down after it hits yep. the grill. Yep. Oftentimes you'll find the fish curling up as soon as it hits the ground. The same thing with the saute pan. I notice when people grill fish at home, they're worried they're, it's going to stick. So two seconds later, they put it on and they try and move it. In fact, fish will stick at first, right? And then it'll come back off if you just have a little patience. Just like a hot saute pan. While this is just like a hamburger. Uh, I I wouldn't. I I I threw I threw every fucking one I had away. Just going. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take a little bit of wine. It could be any white wine of your choice. I'm gonna use a Portuguese vino verde. Okay. I will add a little bit of extra virgin olive oil, and then I will kind of do a pan sauce with this. I'm okay. gonna add a little bit of espalette. What the fuck? In fact, it's uh, French cayenne pepper. Exactly. And this is uh, all of the dried real fruit that you prepared over there. Again, if this is a higher end fish, why are you not letting the fish speak for itself? Why must we slather everything with sauce? Okay. And I'm gonna put this down over here, and I'm gonna kind of let that just come to a bit of a boil. I'm just gonna take one of our clams. Okay. And I'm gonna position it on the bottom. Very ingenious. Just to give us yeah. a little bit, just for right now, Beautiful. just so it steams there nicely. And we'll take a look at our fish. Well, that is not sticking at all. We've got some nice noodles here. Okay. So I'm gonna add some rock shrimp. These have been poached in a little bit of citrus and a little bit of vinegar. Yeah, whenever I do salmon, I wait, uh, especially if it's skin on salmon, I wait till it's like that close to the top. I, I cook it 95% skin side down, then I turn it and sear it on its other side for you know, a minute or two. And that's about it. Would you take a taste of that and you tell me bet. what you think about that? Can't wait. Hang on. Now, what is this? Mm. Hopefully it's poison. That is insane. So I'm getting herbs, citrus, there's... And anchovy or fish sauce? Uh, or little little uh, Vietnamese fish sauce. And uh, a lot of fresh Thai basil, so a lot of mint. This is sort of Balinese pesto. Balinese pesto, okay. yes. If you wouldn't mind uh, putting a little bit of that sure. on top of here. Okay. And I'll continue to check this fish out. This is getting pretty nice. The edges are cooking beautifully. This is starting to cook up a little bit here. So we're opening up all of those dried herbs in there. Do you not have a pot? 
very carefully. I'm gonna try to lift this stuff mm -hmm. very carefully. Mm -hmm. And what I'm gonna do now is Whoa. put it oh, right okay. in there. Wow. Okay. Here, I'll tell you what, let's take the head off, let's maybe. Let's take the head off. I think it's about ready. I'm just gonna let it rest and let's do the clams. Okay, sounds great. I'll put the manila clams in a grill basket. And then it looks like you also brought us some wild garlic. Cut it off. Oh, God, the fucking ice bullshit again. Off here. I think that's good. Good. And then I'm thinking maybe just a little extra virgin olive oil, a little salt, a little freshly ground black pepper. Beautiful. Well, hell, at least you got a pepper mill. And that's not a little bit of pepper. That's like a minuscule amount of pepper. Oh, and I'll put these in. You so need more than two turns of the old pepper together. mill. Beautiful. We'll just lower this down a little bit, really give these guys a big blast of heat. So I like to take a little bit more of the zest, and okay. then I also like to just finish it with just a little bit more olive oil. And if you wouldn't mind oh. squeezing any of the citrus you'd like, Let's see, right now, so we have Meyer lemon, yeah, okay, beautiful. which is California fruit crossed between a uh, mandarin orange and a lemon. So I'll squeeze it between my fingers, catch any seeds. We have a grilled orange. Clementine orange. And then I'm gonna go back on just for a second. A little lime. And a little lime for a little bit more yep. strength of the acid. Yep. Our clams are starting to open. And I'm just going to drizzle a little bit of olive oil down on the plate like this as a sauce. Yeah, beautiful. You could always just do a little bit of salt. All right. I'm going to come around on this side and just keep make sure the clams are opening nicely. I'm going to remove the fish and put it on the plate. Raphael, that looks yeah. insanely good. I'll put a little bit of the salt. No, it looks like a burnt pile of shit. Toss over that. And then if you wouldn't mind uh, just hitting it with some of these fresh chilies, I've got some tongs there for you. Okay. Fresh right. chilies, and then I've got some aromatic herbs, and okay. that's pretty much Well, I guess we all know why this guy is a former owner. The How are those clams looking? Are they just about they open? They are, uh, they're opening up beautifully. Oh, great culinary god, Gordon Ramsay, please come in the middle of this program and yell at them. So it's kind of a plan of linguine and clams in a sense, but you know, uh, okay. just done, just done it. a little yeah. bit differently. We've got noodles, we've got rock shrimp. Okay, noodles in the center of the plate. I've got the clams right here. That's great. Any way you yeah. like, yeah. Beautiful. Just come around with these. For me, that's that's it. A right? wonderful eating meal. Just simple and we just take some of these aromatic herbs. Yep. Now, what do you have there? It's mint, Thai basil, parsley, chervil, dill. Mm. And a bit more olive oil. And that is really. Oh, Jesus! Raphael, 70 bucks for this Bravo. shit? <laughs> Two spectacular dishes. Amazing. Your battle implements. Thank you. You know, this is why I've said, uh, what, what did I call PBS before? Pretentious bitch. I'll have to come up with something for the ass. You. Okay. Well, I'm going to dig right in here. Yeah. Take a little bit wow. of the sauce from Pretentious here. bitch this Susans. Insanely delicious. Or pretentious okay. bitch the sangria. Super crusty, crisp, smoky. And the fish is flaky, but super, yep. but super moist. Super moist. And you get hints of curry, but it's not overpowering. I mean it's so subtle, but it's very pronounced. Mm. Mm. <laughs> Public super bullshit. Refreshing. And I love the sort of crunchy, chewy texture against the fish. There's a lot going on here. I mean, this is a symphony of flavors. Raphael, here's to the ambassadorial powers of the grill. This is why I don't like Steve Reichlin drinking beer. He, we all know he's a wine drinker. Thank you for coming. It's an honor and it's a pleasure. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Grilling is one of my favorite ways to prepare oysters. These oysters. Can this guy can this guy cook like Wisconsin? He's always like, oh, in 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 Thailand or Asia or where the fuck ever. Hold on.
They have all these wonderful flavors. Okay, motherfucker, why don't you try mastering the art of onions, beers, and brats? Look to the far east with Asian aromatics and condiments that will ignite your taste buds. Okay, now, truth be told, I don't like oysters. I, it, I, I just don't. I, I, I've, I've seen them, I've looked at them, and to me it looks like I'm eating a bowl of snot. I just, I can't, I can't look at oysters and eat them. Start by shucking the oysters. Slide an oyster knife under the bivalve to loosen it from the bottom shell. Discard the top shell and arrange the oysters on a shellfish rack. God, it looks like something I blew out of my nose last night. In a mixing bowl, whisk together. Have I cooked with vodka? Yeah. Vodka penne is one of my favorite dishes. Or vodka sauce is one of my favorite sauces. Other soy sauce, mirin. And I probably made a few marinades with vodka, but I'm not I'm not thinking of it at the time, Lord of Cancer. I love cooking with alcohol. And sesame oil. You name the alcohol, chances are I've cooked with it. The only ones I don't think I have are gin and gin. Now hold on, I gotta I gotta bag him up just a just a fucking hair. All right, so he's got his bowls of snot. <laughs> okay, I've never cooked with Jagermeister. In a mixing bowl, whisk together soy sauce, mirin, and sesame oil. Soy sauce, mirin, and sesame oil. Now, mirin is a sweetened version of Japanese sake. But soy sauce and sesame oil are ungodly salty and extremely potent. Ugh. Well, I don't actually like gin. I, I've had a gin and tonic a couple of times, and it tasted like drinking freshly cut grass is all I can explain it as. Fucking hate gin. Drizzle each oyster with a teaspoon of the mixture. Combine thinly... Well, at least you won't be able to taste the oyster. Slice scallion. Minced fresh ginger. By the way, green onion... And again, ginger's gonna overpower the whole fucking dish. And chopped fresh cilantro. What is your fucking obsession with cilantro? You know, there are other herbs on earth. Spoon about a half teaspoon. And by the way, what the fuck does this have to do with Asia? Cilantro, I believe, is native to South America. on top of the oysters set up your grill for direct grilling and place the oysters directly over the fire oh god you fucking pussy needing your fucking gloves get some get some get some fucking man hands grill the oysters until the juices bubble and the oysters are just cooked really cilantro is native to italy hmm i thought it was south america hold on where is cilantro originally from? Cilantro herb uh, closer resembles uh, Southern Europe. I'll be damned. And it came to Mexico in the 1500s. That's why they're so uh, used to cooking with it. Hmm, learn something new every day. I thought it came, I thought it came from South America, to be honest. Four to six minutes. Be careful not to overcook the oysters. The center should stay warm and juicy. Serve the oysters on a bed of salt and enjoy.
When I was at cooking school in Paris, my final exam was an elaborate Franco-Russian dish called salmon kalibiak. The fish was... No, you were right. I was wrong. It's just at some point, I mean, it came, it came to Italy 500 years ago, or it came to Mexico 500 years ago. It was so ingrained in their cooking, I thought it was native. Oh, well, I was wrong. It was stuffed with mushrooms, onions, rice, and eggs, and baked in a brioche crust. The Project Fire version, you guessed it, smoke roasted on the grill. What the hell is Kula? Okay, grilled salmon with smoked eggs. I, 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 okay, I, I have to take a break, and then I'll tell you the only way I know how to smoke, de smoke eggs. Can I watch Copper Cab? If you pay me. Cilantro is more common in Spanish, Greek, and Portuguese cookie than in Italian. Yeah, that's why. That's what threw me off. Every single fucking you know dish that I've heard of from Central South America, it's got fucking cilantro in it. I mean, I love cilantro. My father hates it. Um, in fact, he's got the cilantro gene. Anyway, let's get back into this. No, it was probably some P hammerhead. It was probably... Hell, it might have been Le Cordon Bleu. They turn out these pretentious chefs. Or it was some private culinary whatever the fuck i don't know anyway let's deal with this now grilled salmon and smoked eggs i would never grill a salmon like this just not for nothing because lord of cancer there are people that have what's known as the cilantro gene and they can taste cilantro in anything and it makes everything taste like shit for them. For fish, we're using a whole wild Alaskan coho salmon. So you're taking about $100 worth of fish and mutilating it. Chef Chris boned it earlier today. What the fuck did he do to that thing? Yeah, he boned it with his assistant, Freddy Krueger. Start by seasoning the inside with coarse sea salt. Uh, no, no. And freshly ground black pepper. Oh, God. The next step is to smoke the eggs. Now, I started with hard-boiled eggs in a bowl covered with plastic wrap. Okay. And this is a handheld smoker. Fill the smoking chamber with applewood sawdust. Switch on the smoker, light the wood. Basically, this is what's known as a cold smoker. You can achieve the same thing if you know what you're doing with a barrel smoker and an offset smoke box. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I can do the same thing. 
So you're not really... Why would you put hard-boiled eggs with salmon? What the fuck are you doing? And in a matter of seconds, you'll have a stream of fragrant applewood smoke. Yeah, yeah, my, my dad has it. And yeah, I mean, even like uh, my mom typically doesn't like hot stuff, but I always add, you know, some pinches of red pepper flakes and whatnot to, to pasta sauce just to wake it up. She doesn't notice it. Uh, but yeah, he can notice a pinch of cilantro in something. So yeah, it's... But oh my god, what are you doing? And also, don't cut the fucking eggs open before you smoke them. Keep the fucking things whole. I've made smoked hard-boiled eggs before. Jesus, tap dancing fucking Christ. Oh, God, PBS, give me this guy's show. I'll teach people how to really grill. Fill the bowl with the eggs with applewood smoke and tightly cover with plastic wrap. Let the smoke infuse for four to five minutes and for a stronger smoke flavor, repeat the process. I have some portobello mushroom caps that we brushed with oil, seasoned with salt and pepper. And, and then what, sent them to hell? Grilled and I'll cut them into quarter inch slices. This may seem complicated. You know, it is complicated, but it's not bad if you break it down. Now me, I'm somebody that I have two foods I can't eat. One is mushrooms. I instantly start getting nauseous with mushrooms. But I was kind of, I was pretty allergic to mold as a child. So I don't know if that's a carryover. The only other food I can't eat that gets me instantly sick is sauerkraut. You give me a spoonful of sauerkraut, I, I, I literally, I literally would rather lick fucking Nancy Pelosi's twat than eat a spoonful of sauerkraut. And I think the inside is still raw. I don't usually cook with mushrooms, but I think the inside of them is still raw. So he doubly failed. It's simple steps. Now build your kalibiak. So start with a layer of cooked rice or rice pilaf and spread it over one side of the salmon. Why would you do that to a hundred dollars worth of salmon? You have a wild caught Alaskan salmon. That's all you need. Little butter, little lemon, little dill. This should be the fucking side dish. Not in the goddamn thing. Oh my God, yeah, let's just fuck up hundreds of dollars worth of fish just for his pretentious sorry ass. This is why the only people that actually respect him are a bunch of fucking wine drinking jackasses from the upper crust of Massachusetts. To which I prove time and time again with his cooking school. God, fuck me in a half shot. I'd kick this guy's ass any day of the week. Then top the rice with slivered mushrooms. Well, of course he can. Because he's supported by PBS viewers like you. Yes, your generous donation allows PBS to bring you fine programming like Stephen Reichlin wasting hundreds of dollars worth of meat on his pretentious grilling show. And Sesame Street. Next, you'll want grilled onion rings and arrange the onion on top of the mushrooms. Then take your smoked eggs and arrange them on top what, of the what, onions. Why? Then sprinkle the eggs with chopped fresh dill and essential Russian herb. Finally, I made a little egg salad with the smoked eggs, dill, and mayonnaise and spread the egg salad on the other side 
Uh, Why did you just roll it up in a big fucking piece of flatbread at this point? The salmon is meaningless. The salmon. To review here, we have salmon on the bottom. We have a layer of rice pilaf, grilled portobello mushrooms, grilled onions, smoked eggs, fresh. I am not a vegan, but I will join them in a moment of silence for this poor salmon that gave its life just to be this fucking abused. We all raise our beers to you, brave salmon. And I, as a meat eater, am fucking sorry. Jesus fucking Christ. Just make a, a fucking bit of flatbread, Dolan. Roll that shit up. Fuck me. Jesus Christ. Takes over $100 worth of salmon. One, it was deep up deep. It was butchered before it, before it happened. Still an egg salad. Now, fold the back piece of the salmon over the front piece. This is why I said, just make a flatbread dough and roll it up. Put it on the grill. Why did this salmon have to give its life for this shit? And it's falling all over the place already, jackass. And kind of force the stuffing into the fish. Don't worry if a little pops out, you can tie it in with the string. Next, arrange two slices of applewood smoked oh my bacon God. atop the salmon. And, and this is where he gets insulting with the bacon. Why don't you wrap it in bacon? And tie the whole shebang together with trussing string. So we'll loop over once, twice, locks the string in place, and pull tightly. Next, tie the bottom of the fish. Which squeezed the egg out completely. And now with kitchen scissors, cut off the excess string. Or you could let the grill burn it up. And there, folks, is your Project Fire Salmon Kalibiak. Now the grill. I'll Why do I think if this is a Russian dish, uh, every single Russian grandma would be slapping the ever-loving fuck out of this guy? Jesus Christ, you took what? A hundred, two hundred dollar, beautiful, beautiful salmon. Showed it no respect, completely butchered it. Oh my fucking God, where is Gordon Ramsay when I need him? I'll cook the salmon Kulibiak on a gas grill. I've set it up for classic indirect grilling. That means outside burners on high and the inside burners off. I'm sorry, but you can't do indirect grilling on a gas grill. It's impossible. Get a charcoal grill. I'll cook the fish on a bed of fresh fennel. That will add extra flavor. It will also keep the salmon from sticking. It will also add an extra licorice flavor, if you know anything about fennel. It has a very strong licorice thing. Again, just trying to masquerade your... Oh, my God. I've never felt sorry for an animal before that gave its life for food. This time I do. Jesus fucking Christ. You poor, poor salmon. Lift the fish up and arrange it on the fennel. Then to generate a smoke flavor... Lift the lid of the smoker box. Add unsoaked. This is an abomination to grilling. Chips to the smoker. Why unsoaked? You want to generate a strong blast of smoke right away. If you're gonna smoke the fucking salmon, you don't eat all the other bullshit. Oh my god. Jesus Christ, fuck it. I'm joining John Sakars. Just to prevent him from bastardizing more salmon. 
God, you fucking pretentious New England fucking jackass. God, fuck me. If you're going to make smoked salmon, this is what you do. Maybe a little salt. Maybe a little pepper. That's it. You smoke the fucking thing. Oh my god. And you can't do indirect grilling on a gas grill. Fuck off. Close the lid. Grilling time about 45 minutes. I wish you were a successful author, so the only way I'd know you is in the literature section and not in my territory. And by the way, I could kick your ass any day twice on Sunday. It's been 45 minutes. Oh, take the pussy glove off. And check out the salmon Kolibiak. Looks amazing, right? It looks done. But I always like to check with an instant read meat thermometer. You know, wherever this dish originates from, whatever grandma from that region would probably slap the shit out of him. 145 degrees, we're in business. I'll slide a fish spatula under the tail end, kind of grab the top, gently transfer the salmon flebiac. Okay. Now what you want to do is snip those strings. Just, just stop, it's already dead and carefully pull them out. And then start cutting the Kolibiak into slices. Beautiful. Well, it's drier than fuck. You see all that flaking action? Drier than fuck. Great. You bastardized, you mutilated, and you destroyed a great fish. Congratulations, asshole. And I'll take a slice, slide it on the knife blade, and turn it onto the plate. That looks dry. That looks like canned salmon. Oh my fucking god, Jesus Christ. And, a and of course we're gonna drizzle some fucking sauce in the vain hope some moisture will return to it. I do these videos for $5. Wouldn't it be easier if I just hired a dominatrix and for $5 a pop she just kicks me in the nuts? Sour cream dill sauce, traditionally served with Kulibiak. The recipe's on the website. Now let's see if it's how I remember it. And let's see, he's gonna take one really tiny piece. First the yep. salmon. The salmon is falling apart because it is drier than fuck. Hmm. The salmon is moist and nicely smoky and sour cream dill sauce. Which was most of that bite. You know, I haven't eaten salmon Kalibiak in at least 25 years, and I never thought I'd make it on the grill. Well, any grandmother made salmon Kalibiak probably slapped the living hell out of you. But I love what the smoke and fire add to that traditional Franco-Russian recipe. It's time to quash those fish grilling fears. Wrap it in banana leaves to keep it moist. Practice patience. Explore world flavors to elevate your dishes. Don't listen to anything this guy has to say. Or grill over a bed of fennel to keep your fish from sticking. Now you know how fish hits the fire in my world. See you next time.
for recipes. Steve, I would rather have dinner with a militant vegan than taste your grilling. You completely butchered that fucking fish. I've never felt that, that amount of sorrow for an animal that gave its life for our tummies. I at least try to honor the fucking thing when I cook it. And more live fire cooking, visit stephenreichland.com. All right, fine. Fuck it. I think we're done here anyway. All right, it's just his fucking bullshit. Time we at. All right, we'll do this one. What the hell? Or right, we'll do a little bit. Okay, now he's dealing with brisket. Brisket is the Mount Everest of barbecue. No, it's not. You just gotta know what you're doing. Posing. And it's not hard. And intimidating. And it's also not using a pellet grill. Conquering it firmly establishes you in the barbecue elite. Today, I'm going to show you how to barbecue. If if beating you establishes me in the elite, are you sure you're not thinking of the elite Cub Scouts? Barbecue a full pack of brisket like the pros do in Texas. Well, I can tell you right now, I think that shit's overcooked and there's not enough juice on the tray. Just not for nothing. You're supposed to, when you bite down on a brisket sandwich, have the juice pouring out. That don't seem to be happening here. This is the full packer brisket. The first step is to make the rub. Black peppercorns, fennel seeds, and whole cumin seeds. And you roast the spices in a dry skillet over medium-high heat to brown the spices, bring out the aromatic oils, give them a toasted, smoky flavor. Why? Because you're also going to have, if you burn even a couple of them, you're going to have that burnt flavor th throughout the entire rub. Again, I ask, why? You can see the smoke rising. Smell the aromatic oils. So I'll turn the heat off. The spices are lightly toasted. Transfer uh, the roasted spices to a spice mill. And grind to a fine powder. Do you know how you could also achieve this effect? Uh, take the pre-ground spices, you know, that were, that, or, 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 or take the whole spices, grind them beforehand, and then as the smoker is getting up to temp, pop them in the smoker for 15 fucking minutes. Boom! Smoke spices! Ain't that fucking hard? Amazing. Or you can place the smoke, the whole things in the smoker and then grind them. Point is, wouldn't do it this way. Roma. Now transfer the ground spices to a bowl and add coriander for an aromatic fragrance and sweet paprika brown sugar which will help the meat caramelize where did you get that brown sugar and finally coarse sea salt and cracked peppercorns mix the 
ingredients for the spice rub with your fingers, breaking up any lumps in the brown sugar. This is a full Packer brisket, so called because this is. And yep, he did the goddamn ice thing. Oh my god. I... Look, if no one ever takes another bit of cooking advice, please take this one. When you're dealing with basically anything, let it get up to room temperature. Now, yes, if you leave chicken or turkey out overnight at room temperature, you have a problem. But you don't keep shit stone cold. Now, Roy, Dave, well, if it's stone cold in the center, then it's gonna, then it's gonna cook unevenly. Jesus fucking Christ, it ain't that hard how it comes from the packing house. A full packer brisket is actually comprised of two separate muscles. On the bottom is this lean muscle called the brisket flat, and then on top, there's a second muscle, uh, much more generously marbled. Yeah, called the point, but here's the problem. The point usually sucks because it's so fatty, it gets to be a pain in the ass to work with. The flat is much easier to cook with. Known as the point. And makes the better sandwiches. Your first step is to trim the packer brisket. The idea is to trim your brisket so it has what the great brisket master Aaron Franklin calls an aerodynamic shape. Please don't use his name. When trimming your brisket, you want to err on the side of too much fat rather than too little. Remember, the fat will melt during the cooking process, basting the meat, keeping it moist. Oh, yeah, no, I, I let, I leave, uh, the only, only I, I, like, if I'm making, a, like, a prime rib roast, I leave it out for two hours before it, before I put it in the oven. Burger, I leave out for at least an hour. You know, 30 minutes to an hour, because if it's too cold, you can't work with it. If it's too warm, you can't work with it. You gotta kind of hit that sweet spot where it's about 50-ish degrees. I'm going to prepare the Packer brisket in a style I call East-West. We're going to spread it with a Korean chili paste called gojujang. You can find this in Asian markets and many supermarkets or order it online. Every single Texan right now is ready to lynch him. Gochujang is made with Korean chilies, rice, salt, garlic, all of which are fermented together. In Thank you. Elite. Oh my God. Hold on. I got to get back to him. God damn it. A first layer of the gochujang. Then season it with your roasted spice mix. Thank you for bastardizing brisket. Yeah, brisket might be the Mount Everest, but Lord knows you couldn't even climb a foothill of Everest. And here's your Packer brisket with the double layer of flavor, the gochujang, and the roasted spice rub. To smoke the brisket, I'm using an offset smoker. It has a firebox on one side, lower than the cook chamber. Open the firebox door, you can see I have a bed of lit charcoal. You can't use lump charcoal in a, in a smoker. You can use briquettes, but you can't use lump. Oh my God. And to generate the wood smoke, we'll lay a log on the coals. Now close the firebox. The way you control the heat is by opening and closing these dampers on the firebox. You use lump charcoal, it doesn't matter. 
Here's how I do it. I just start a damn fire. Now, this is the cook chamber. You, you know what I use to, 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 to fire on my smokers? Wood. You can see. And let it rise and fall with temperatures. It's higher up and offset from the firebox. I'll open it up and pull out. Once again, you need somebody to idiot proof it for you. Bottom shelf. And you're supposed to be the fucking expert. Then transfer the packer brisket to the bottom shelf. Push the drawer back now. It's not that Place hot. Place the packer brisket in your smoker. Close the door of the smoker and adjust the vent on top. You want a cooking temperature of 250 degrees. The Which there is no way to get with lump charcoal. My God, you, you, you're not even telling the di people the difference between lump charcoal and briquettes. And by the way, both have a function, faggot. Oh my fucking goddamn fucking cock sucking Christ! Okay, fine. Steve, you don't want to educate the people? Fine, I fucking will. Okay, lump charcoal is used in direct grilling. This is for things like ahi tuna, steaks, um, lamb, uh, bison, um, burgers and uh in, in its dying stages uh hot dogs right now briquettes they're used in low and slow this is good for things like chicken turkey well poultry fish most of it except maybe salmon and ahi tuna um there for low and slow now if he had briquettes lit it should be uh briquettes because they burn longer in fact several times longer than lump charcoal for christ fucking sakes you're supposed to be the goddamn barbecue expert and you can't even tell people Hey, by the way, I lit this with lump charcoal because it's a television show. To smoke a brisket as long as it needs to be smoked, you're going to need lump charcoal. The Packer brisket is going to cook for about 12 hours. There are actually three stages to cooking a Packer brisket. At about 140 degrees, you will notice an interesting phenomenon. The temperature will plateau, it may even drop a little. This is called the stall, it's a natural part of the process of cooking a whole brisket. What's happening is, as the liquid evaporates from the surface of the brisket- Are you gonna tell them how long it takes? Brisket, it actually cools the brisket down, much the way when you perspire, it cools you down. The stall can last anywhere from one to three hours. Don't worry about the stall. It's a natural part of cooking the brisket. The temperature will start to rise again, sure as daylight follows night. We're seven hours into the cook. We powered through the stall. It's probably time to wrap the brisket. Seven hours? Oh, he's... Uh, uh, Okay, I hope he wraps it. Open it, it up. Oh. <laughs> Look at that. You didn't make that from just lump charcoal, motherfucker. And your temp on your gauge is way too low. An instant read meat thermometer. We'll check it. We wrap between 160, 170 degrees. 165, we're ready. Now, I spread two sheets of unlined butcher paper, sometimes called pink paper, on my work surface.
Now the wrap serves two purposes. It seals in the juices and it keeps the outside of the brisket, the bark, from browning too much. Fold the butcher paper over one way and then you'll come over the top like this. Roll the brisket, then pull the top flap over the brisket, then just tuck the bottom in like this. And you'll cook the briskets for another two to four hours. So at maximum, it's 11 hours. That big bastard should have been overnight minimum. <laughs> that big bastard should have been 24 hours minimum. Again, maybe maybe I got maybe the camera made it bigger, but I would have done that thing. I would have done that thing. I would have gotten up at. If I was gonna have people over for brisket sandwiches at six o'clock p.m., I would have started that thing six a.m. nine o'clock at the previous night at the minimum. been 12 hours and the full packer brisket should be ready check the temperature you can go right in through the paper you do know it's beef you can eat the fucking shit raw looking for about 200 we're at 199 that's good enough for me now the packer brisket goes into your cooler. I know you're dying to try it, but trust me, if you let it rest in an insulated cooler, the meat will be even more tender, more succulent. Or if you smoked it properly. Also, why should you rest it? You don't let anything else rest. Here's your Packer brisket rested for two hours Ugh. and look how beauteous that is to carve the brisket i'm using a shun brisket knife pull out the pin unsheath the knife a full packer brisket consists of two muscles the flat whose grains run this way and the point whose grains run this way cut the brisket in half. Then, on your flat, we'll just cut off the end here and start slicing the brisket. It slices beautifully. I'd like to call your attention to the smoke ring. That's that subcutaneous layer of red. I'm wondering where all the juice is. Reddish pink, it's a naturally occurring reaction that takes place when the smoke hits the meat. It's a sure sign that you've done your smoking correctly. So here are your brisket flat slices. And this end piece is a little bit too charred to serve in slices. So I'll simply cut it into dice and serve this. Do you not know how to fucking cut things properly? This as your burnt ends. Well, make sure to bastardize them. Okay, no, um... If the... Ground beef is a little different. You're not gonna die. You'll most likely be fine. The reason you have to drag ground beef to a, certain, to a higher temperature is because it's all the meat mixed in. But when you're dealing with like a steak or a roast, again, there's steak tartare, which is raw beef. 
um, you should be fine. And because yeah, all the all the uh, impurities live just on the surface. So cut a couple of thin slices off, you're fine. We're gonna carve the brisket point this way. Beautiful. Look at that, look at that. You can see how generously marbled the meat is. No, it's not. In fact, it looks dry. Here's your brisket point. And you can see from one brisket, you have three completely different cuts of meat. You've got your burnt ends, your lean brisket flat. That looks, oh, hold on, hold on. I, I want to back this up, just a hair here. Completely different cuts of meat. You've got. Let's see. Your burnt ends look like dried out piles of shit. Your flat looks like a burnt out pile of shit. I mean, this picture summarizes him perfectly. Everything is overcooked, unappetizing, and his only hope is to slather it in some stupid sauce. Jesus fucking Christ. I mean, look at his burn ends. There's no ju Where is the juice on this serving tray? got your burnt ends, your lean brisket flat, and your fatty brisket point. In Texas, brisket is traditional. By the way, the fat's already congealed and hardened again. Good job. Either you turned the fat into gristle, or you waited that long. Traditionally served with slices of white bread. To play off the east-west dynamic in this dish, I have Chinese steam buns. And oh God, why? We'll place a couple of slices of brisket in the bun. Next, add. Any wonder why I hate PBS? Add a spoonful of goju jang. Like you can eat, you can eat raw beef. I wouldn't recommend eating raw hamburger though. Barbecue sauce. The recipe's on the website. Except if you know exactly what farm it came from and how they raise their cows, then you can. Mm. So smoky, so spicy, the meat is tender. And so very fucking dry. I love the soft chew of the steam bun. This is a perfect fusion of East and West flavors. The Texas smokiness of the brisket, fire and spice of the goat. Oh God, I hate PBS. And that's where I'm gonna end this. I've had enough. I'll see everyone tomorrow or, well, I don't, actually I don't know, I got family in town, so I'll see everyone later. That's all I'm gonna say. Mother fucking fucking goddamn fucking hell. This is horrible. How much more food can this guy bastardize? Seriously, nobody would buy this. He'd get last place in a barbecue. Seriously, can we get like a change.org petition going? Get Steve Reichlin to actually go to a barbecue competition and compete? If he gets above last place, I'll be shocked. Anyway, that wraps up these motherfuckers.